Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Parthamore, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Council on Strategic Risks. Thank you so much to everyone who's joining us for today's discussion. For background, CSR is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank dedicated to analyzing and addressing core systemic risks to security in the 21st century. One of our initiatives is running what we call the Alliance to End Biological Threats, through which we bring together top scientists, policy experts, technologists, and business and nonprofit leaders who share a common vision that the future, that future disease outbreaks can be detected and responded to so rapidly and effectively that they never again reach pandemic scale. A critical aspect of this vision is improving early warning or detecting and understanding a potentially dangerous pathogen as quickly as possible. This is a crucial element of pandemic prevention and countering disease threats of all sources. The capabilities that enable early warning have been advancing for decades, though as we all have witnessed in the current pandemic, this work has uh, not been sufficient in the past. One of the good news stories uh, in recent years is that COVID-19, however, has forced rapid innovation and helped put emerging tools into action in ways that we've never seen before. It's important to understand these advances and to sustain them and continue building on them moving forward in order to prevent future pandemics. COVID-19 has shown how infectious diseases can devastate people across the globe, drive economic hardship and affect national security. So it's imperative that we do all that we can in the years ahead to prevent this from happening again. To discuss this topic today, we have two fantastic pan panelists who are at the forefront of innovation and driving new technologies into the field um, to prevent future pandemics and create the early warning systems that the world needs. Dr. Mariana Matus is CEO and co-founder of Biobot Analytics, a wastewater testing company that she co-founded in 2017. As Dr. Matus will discuss, Biobot has pioneered wastewater testing for COVID-19, producing valuable data on the spread of the virus, as well as the prominence of different variants over time. Matt McKnight is the Chief Commercial Officer at Ginkgo Bioworks and leads Ginkgo's biosecurity efforts. Ginkgo's concentric initiative has been instrumental in kindergarten through 12th grade testing for COVID-19 in schools and tying testing with sequencing so that we can better understand disease trends. Ginkgo is also conducting testing in airports around the nation, among other efforts. For the audience today, please feel free to submit questions either through the chat or the Q&A function. We will select a few to ask our panelists toward the end of today's discussion. Thank you again for joining us, uh, including to our special guests here to share more about their work and the insights that they've gathered from it. Mariana, let's start with you. Can you please share a short overview? of what Biobot's been doing and help us understand why wastewater? What is the power of this tool? How does it work? Absolutely, thank you, Christine. And thank you, CSR, for the opportunity to speak here today and to tell you a little bit more about our work at Biobot and wastewater epidemiology. Um, so Biobot, you know, as, as you mentioned, we founded it back in 2017. And from the get-go, we have always been um, a company fully dedicated to the implementation of wastewater epidemiology. Um, we collect and test wastewater samples to measure the concentration of the virus that causes COVID-19 through PCR. And this wastewater data reflects the true level of COVID-19 infection in a city or a town because like not everybody six a test, but everybody poops. Um, and you know, human waste data uh, contains information on our health, on our exposures, and therefore um, wastewater is not waste. Wastewater is a valuable data asset that we all contribute to naturally by using the toilet. Um, throughout the pandemic, we have mostly focused on collecting data that represents you know, entire cities, entire towns. Um, we, at the moment, work across 42 states in the US, and our data represents about 10% of the US population. Um, but more recently, we have also begun now to work with smaller scale communities like nursing homes, schools, colleges, um, jails, prison systems, and office buildings. Increasingly, we also see interest from new potential sentinel sites 
um, such as airports. And beyond COVID <clears throat> PCR data, we have also been looking at the emergence and spread of variants through sequencing data here in collaboration with uh, Ginkgo Bioworks um, and have demonstrated um, also the successful detection of influenza A, influenza B, uh, which will be huge, you know, as we think about uh, the endemic part of COVID and when, you know, we have to live with it, just as we do with flu, as well as high risk substances such as fentanyl and meth that have continues to grow in the background of the pandemic with less attention and less resources to it. Um, and so we can really think about wastewater as a versatile platform where you can look at a multitude of threats, natural, man-made, you know, and, and, and things like, you know, even more, com more complex things too, like an antibiotic resistance um, that, that has global impact. So that's a little bit of what we have been doing. It's incredible work and again the the spread of the coverage of what you've been doing and um, can't wait to hear more about the results as well it's been a fantastic asset that's been developing in recent years thank you uh, and Matt over to you can you tell us more about Ginkgo's COVID-19 work in airports and schools a little bit about how you got there and um, are you one question I have as well as whether you're using similar approaches between schools and airports as such different venues or if that requires different works on Ginkgo's part you could start by telling us more about what Ginkgo is up to. Yeah, sure. Well, and first of all, thank you for um, including us and it's super exciting to be here with Mariana. Um, I think like the big picture piece of this that that uh, Mariana, you mentioned is this is about different approaches and a layered set of new ways to generate data in the context of uh, this pandemic. But, you know, as we look forward, uh, future infectious disease threats. Um, you know, I think, I think from our standpoint, the best way to look at what Ginkgo has done in um, building the infrastructure that we've built to work in schools, but also other congregate settings, we, we kind of like think about this new way of defining biosecurity. We weren't a diagnostics company, um, you know, unlike BioBot, uh, as many folks know about Ginkgo, and I'll share a little bit in the, uh, how we came into this in a second, but we didn't come into this as a pandemic response company or with, a, with an infectious disease monitoring mission. What we said is, well, there seems to be a big gap in testing, but really the kind of testing, not so much diagnostic testing when you are sick and present yourself uh, to get a diagnosis, we, that was a, a weakness for the country, but that, that had infrastructure to scale. For a respiratory illness, we saw a weakness in the type of testing you would need in these kind of non-traditional settings, pre-vaccine and pre other mitigation tools to get people back into some semblance of risk mitigated uh, congregate settings. And, you know, there's a number of those, obviously people talk about workplaces, et cetera, but uh, as parents, I have an eight and five-year-old uh, and Ginkgo full of, uh, you know, an amazing group of human beings said, wait a second, this problem of schools and schools being in person is one that we have to solve. It's, it's a very hard challenge. Um, and so we just asked ourselves the question, what is the type of testing that is needed to monitor proactively so that you're able to detect outbreaks before they get out of control, so that you're able to have early warning to take mitigation measures of multiple different sorts. So that's really the, the approach that we took to come into it. Uh, we started working with others, you know, the Broad Institute here in Massachusetts did it as well. The, the uh, Charlie Baker's um, administration really drove this, but really thinking about how do you do, as a start point, kind of group testing, uh, in this case, pooled cohort testing, as a starting point to get a baseline of data so that school administrators through public health officials could have more information to make good decisions. That evolved and then with the, with the investment from the Biden administration and school testing, um, we took that infrastructure and actually realized um, very quickly uh, in a little bit of a counterintuitive approach, like we were never gonna build a lab big enough, that's not our core business, we're, we're a, um, a synthetic biology company to be able to run these at Ginkgo, why don't we partner across the country and we built this really big lab network um, with labs that were running diagnostic tests to enable them with the infrastructure, uh, both from a software and management of people perspective, but also uh, an assay development infrastructure to, to do this group testing across the country. Because the actual objective was, how do we build national infrastructure to test up to 56 million K through 12 students in an equitable and widely distributed manner? 
And so fast forward, that was kind of an exciting moment back at the end of uh, 2020, uh, where we were able to build this big lab network across the country, almost 60 labs signed up. Uh, and now, you know, fast forward all the way through the, the administration's investment in the K-12 testing space. We're working, uh, running 10 statewide programs. We're operating in over 24 states um, and really doing that on a, how do you provide tools now, now far beyond just group cohort testing, uh, kind of an integrated platform to be able to do diagnostic and symptomatic and other modalities uh, and building on what Mariana's saying, like we think about these as just different types of data generators um, for different types of situations. So that's exciting on the school front. We then took that same infrastructure and pivoted it and said, where are the other kind of biomonitoring jobs to be done? You know, if we imagine a future of monitoring for pandemics, where are the other places where this is super important? And we partnered with Express Check and CDC and we're using that same infrastructure to do monitoring at airports, entirely voluntary, um, looking at countries of origin and being able to do group testing to do surveillance, which uh, Dr. Walensky spoke about this program uh, a couple months ago, to be able to do inbound surveillance um, of variants coming across borders in a very, I guess, closer to, you know, um, kind of height of pandemic phase. And we were able to find kind of pretty early uh, the BA2 and BA3 sublineages of Omicron. Um, and start demonstrating, which we'll get into, start demonstrating what you can do by this proactive monitoring um, to get further left of kind of their very specific event from a data generation standpoint. So those are big programs. We can talk a little bit more uh, in the future, but you know that it's really started to hit a point of scale. I think we're you know collecting something like 280,000 samples per week from individuals across the country at this point, um, which is which is really just the start point of large scale infrastructure. Agreed. Thank you. Yes. And um, for both of you and for, for our audience generally for background, um, one, of the, one of the things that we think is a myth that is encountered in thinking about the policy side of getting toward early warning and pandemic prevention, um, we need to have the reminders out there as well that the, while there was amazing work to apply technologies and tools and infrastructure and talented people to address COVID-19 and sort of a surge of that, once we knew that the pandemic was hitting and, and what the scale of it could be, um, those things didn't start the day before that. <laughs> so the technologies that you have all developed and brought to bear on this specific problem and are continuing to use to try to address the current pandemic um, and hopefully positioning them for future ones, um, these things took investment and sustained attention in developing them in advance of that. So um, wanted to get to that side of the story a little bit as well. Matt, you sort of explained this a little bit. Um, in terms of how ginkgo was surging. You can add uh, to that if you wish. Um, but turning first to Mariana, um, what's that? What's the little bit more of the story that you could tell about how both you, you've you been working in this field, um, my understanding, for, for many years and did your PhD work on it and that transitioned into technology development that transitioned to where you are today. Can you share a little bit about that background and what that journey has been like that led you to be able to apply this technology to addressing the COVID pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my co-founder, Nusha Gailey, and I met as research collaborators at MIT. And we worked together on wastewater epidemiology projects for about three years before deciding to found BioBot. The, the opportunity that we saw was that at the time, this was, you know, 2014 to 2017, uh, at the time, uh, wastewater epidemiology was still a very niche and very obscure area of research. Even within academia, you couldn't find more than five to 10 groups in the entire country working on it. And the opportunity that we saw was that, you know, one day this type of data will be collected everywhere and it will completely change how we do public health and how re we respond to pandemics. And it has the potential to become the, the new central pillar to inform public health action. Uh, before COVID-19, we were focused on addressing the opioid crisis, which was considered the number one public health problem for the country. Um, but when COVID-19 hit in early 2020, we saw the opportunity to demonstrate that wastewater is a versatile platform to respond to new threats and that it mirrors 
the needs of waste of public health it, it really mirrors it can be a, a very good tool for them so we were we were very fortunate that in february of 2020 a clinical report first uh, showed that you could find rna from the virus not only in the saliva or in the nasal swabs but also in other bodily fluids including urine and poop so that was all we needed uh, to, to go out and do the experiments. In, in less than four weeks, we developed and validated a PCR assay to quantify the level of COVID virus in the wastewater. So it was you know, very early on that we had that capability. And from that initial technical validation, we launched a pro bono campaign to encourage communities across the country to submit wastewater samples for analysis at no cost. We did it because you know, we were able to, we demonstrated it was technically possible to do it, but we didn't know if there would be the appetite or interest from communities to see this data that has never been heard about before. Surprisingly, um, uh, we, it, it was an effort that went actually very well received it went viral in social media and in the press, and it demonstrated something really interesting. Um, it was actually wastewater treatment plants that stepped up and responded to our call to action. They had the samples and they had relatively flexible funding to pay for the service. So it was them that stepped up to start funding um, the creation of this new data and put it in available for the people who can actually take action from it. However, you know, treatment plants aren't the data users. They, they are a fundamental necessary stakeholder to, to enable wastewater epidemiology, but they aren't the data users. And from our perspective, they also should not be the payers. The financial burden shouldn't be on them. It is public health experts, policymakers, that can take action based on this new intelligence. And you know, over the course of the pandemic, we have been seeing and witnessing as low uptake on that side. But to this day, that remains a key challenge in establishing wastewater epidemiology as a national platform. There isn't a clear payer or owner of wastewater epidemiology projects in most jurisdictions. And to this day, still many treatment plants are the ones who are paying for the work to be done, but the data is not fully making the circle and the, the, the feedback and the cycle back to the decision makers. Um, Boston is, is, is one of the most successful examples, like the state of Massachusetts, where the data actually goes full circle um, all the way to the health department, to the governor, governor's office and team, as well as publicly to to the citizens and to the and to the hospitals and to the uh, scientists and experts, and I think like we need to make sure that we can enable that like everywhere. It's it's not enough to create the data. You really need that support and that that uh, local expertise to be able to look at it and and the financial uh, support for it too. Absolutely, I think. That multiple very important points there um, again rooted in the commitment to the discovery side and the the work that you did earlier in your career that led to you being able to jump in and try something new um, was not off the bat but I think it's such an important point that um, in this pandemic we've experienced unconventional stakeholders stepping up to do pro bono work um, we've seen this time and again with academic labs uh, companies uh, others that have, have stepped up basically to do things um, often unpaid that you you normally would not expect people to be doing. But we also, as, as wonderful as that is, that that as a human story, we also can't rely on that and you can't plan around that, right, for the future. So making sure that for future efforts that there are sustained models that don't require people to make an active decision or, or for their board to have to make a decision or whatever the model is to, to apply pro, pro bono services, basically, that that gets resolved moving forward. So very important point. And 
Um, it's a great story, including with the wastewater plants uh, becoming an unconventional actor um, serving in heroic ways during the pandemic. Um, Matt, do you have anything to add? Um, you told us a little bit about the fate of it. Um, do you have any other specific lessons out of Ginkgo's surge uh, to react that you would like to par uh, convey? Yeah, I think this is a really important point to build on, right? So I would say that this is the big footing shift that we are seeing around how can we use this kind of crucible moment of COVID-19, which is as, many, as, as much as anything else as a warning to what could come in the future and use that and the infrastructure and these kind of creative unique partnerships that have been built to better prepare ourselves, right? Like the topic of this conversation. And I'd say like the two big things that we're seeing, um, take it outside of even what we're doing, is just this mindset shift that needs to exist amongst um, everybody from policymakers to private sector companies to philanthropic organizations to academia, uh, which very specifically on the monitoring side is to realize we are orders of magnitude off in scale for data collection. And this is, this is a statement that is maybe one of the few areas of kind of human activity where we don't do large scale pervasive passive monitoring of data is the most dangerous, which is infectious disease and pandemic threats. So we collect, we spend billions of dollars each year monitoring the weather to know how, weeks ahead of time when hurricanes are gonna hit the East Coast. We take it to the other end of the spectrum. We spend, there's a massive industry around collecting data on real estate as a totally orthogonal example to inform decision-making about which buildings to invest in or not, to which buildings to move into or not. And if we think about the, the, the mindset shift that has happened with COVID is to realize because it was a respiratory illness that spread so rapidly, the infrastructure that places like Biobot have built or what we're doing in a massive scale across the country is really orders of magnitude larger surveillance than we ever contemplated in the past to be able to rapidly detect things. Now, we, and there's a great question we can get to, but like, how do you then use repurpose that infrastructure for future unknown threats? I think there's some really interesting thinking around that, but that's an infrastructure that never has existed before. And our big mistake would be to let it kind of, you know, uh, pitter away because COVID has come into an endemic phase. I think that's the, the big mindset change that we're hoping to see. And then like the correlated piece is because of this rapid investment, kind of like any period of crisis in history, um, the cost of doing these things has dropped dramatically. Systems that never would have been built before, large scale testing systems that can be deployed nationally that would have cost massive investment, no private investor and very few government investors would have put that in place without the crucible of a pandemic have been built already. So the, the upfront investment doesn't need to exist anymore. But what we need to do is change our mindset of how much we're paying for data collection and leveraging the systems that are that exist to do so. And, and that's, I think, the big footing that I'd really love to advocate for is let's just spend as much on pandemic data collection as we do on weather data collection. And that would be a starting point, let alone national security monitoring infrastructure, where we're looking at, you know, people moving missiles an inch and spending tens of billions of dollars to watch for that something that is not nearly as an existential threat in my mind as you know the next uh, the next infectious disease that we don't see coming. Um, and so that plus the cost changing, I think that should be like a mindset shift for, for folks thinking about how to protect ourselves from systemic risk for biology going forward. Excellent, thank you. And, and agree, it's coming from the defense side, um, doing biodefense years ago um, in the US uh, Department of Defense and thinking about specific bases and embassies we have abroad, you would do persistent environmental and environmental monitoring, excuse me. Um, and again, uh, you, you need the steady state and you need to invest in that steady state. And um, definitely agree that, that that needs to be the mindset for pandemic prevention as well. Um, getting to the, some of the results. So what are some of the outputs that you've seen from the technologies that you've been working and, and the projects that you've been undertaking to this, what are some of the most important or interesting things that you found in the course of your work, whether that be trends in the diseases or the power of specific tools in specific circumstances or whatever the case may be. So 
as we talked about, the um, a future early warning system is going to have to involve different tools and technologies. It's going to have to be layered and have different approaches to different to getting different types of data. So sort of curious what, what is being produced and what are some of the most interesting outputs um, that you've seen from the initiatives you've both been running. Mariana first and then Matt. Yes, I think that you know over the past couple of years, um, through through the self-funding activities, through the support from wastewater treatment plants, but also now through the support of short-term contract opportunities with um, federal agencies, we have been able to produce um, a vast amount of wastewater data. Um, so this past summer, we held a contract with the US Department of Health, Health and Human Services in collaboration with the CDC, and we created data for them on um, from every state in the country, as well as several US territories. Um, we collected data from 350 sites that together represented almost 30% of the US population. And we uh, analyzed the wastewater, not only with a PCR test to look at the trends in the, in the, in the disease, but also um, we applied uh, the sequencing data analysis. Um, again, this was in partnership with Kinko um, in order to look at the emergence and spread of variants. Um, through, these, uh, through these efforts, we have now collected so much data that we have been able now to understand better, uh, sort of like how, how it complements clinical data. So um, what we have learned are two main pieces of it. When you have mass PCR testing in place, basically when, when you, <coughs> apologies for that. Uh, when you have lots of, of clinical testing in place happening, um, wastewater closely correlates with clinical data. They are basically uh, telling you the same thing. And this is still valuable because wastewater is giving you an independent confirmation of the trends that the clinical data is giving you. So it's giving you the peace of mind that you're not missing out on something that may be happening in your community because you know these two data sources are completely independent from each other. Um, moreover, uh, during last summer, uh, we were able to see the fall of the alpha variant and the rise of the delta variant through the sequencing data. It very, it, it very closely mirrored what we saw in the clinical sequencing data too. So what this has done now is it has established the credibility of wastewater data as data that is really capturing the same fidelity as clinical data, but at a fraction of the cost. Now, during the Omicron wave, something new happened. Um, the, the testing behavior has drastically changed over the past few months. And now more and more people and more and more jurisdictions are switching to rapid antigen testing over PCR testing. And we are also seeing a large decline in just PCR services overall. So what we saw is that wastewater data be began to emerge as the primary source of truth for what was actually happening. It was the first time in the pandemic when wastewater data wasn't seen as uh, something new, you know, or something interesting or something that complements clinical data but rather as, as actually the primary source of truth and maybe the more correct version of it. Again, given this big switch in the PCR testing behavior. Um, moreover, we also saw that the wastewater data peaked two weeks earlier than the clinical data. So it provided a two week um, leading time to understand when we would see the the, this, the spike and the peak of clinical cases, and moreover, later on for hospitalizations. And, and this data was incredibly valuable, was followed very closely um, by several jurisdictions because it really became an early warning system for what we can expect to see 
in the clinical and in the healthcare ecosystem. Um, something else that we also saw during this Omicron wave was that we were able to see Omicron um, and the new subvariant BA2 in wastewater samples um, before clinic before we saw it in the clinical data. <clears throat> so, so I think like that also points at the future applications to track new infectious diseases uh, in a more in faster and more nimble way than purely relying on, on the clinical testing system. That's excellent. The, the two weeks <clears throat> head start basically in, in looking at trends is pretty fascinating, especially from a policy. You think about the mass mandate changes and things like that, that it, it's pretty clear that that could be a powerful thing if sustained on sort of an ongoing basis in terms of policy responses that are more effective. Um, also really appreciate what you said in terms of filling that gap as testing behavior changes. We all know from the beginning of the pandemic when tests weren't even available, um, this has been a huge issue, but again, how, how useful it is and how complete it is comes down to human behavior, which you can't really control that much. And I know as uh, someone with a toddler, you know, knowing the weaknesses of testing, you know, if you get to think about the weather map and it driving personal behavior, the weaknesses in the testing and the, the absence of other data to go by certainly, you know, from a, a personal perspective, drive behavior for individuals across the nation as well. So. That, that's all very fascinating um, findings. It sounds like there's a lot of rich, rich lessons um, in terms of the specific types of findings that have come out of this initiative. Um, Matt, what, what's some of the most interesting things you've learned from yours? And then we'll start interspersing some audience questions. Yeah, I'd say like, so I'll go to the, to the other end of the spectrum, which has been fascinating for us and maybe evidenced by um, the amount of work that Biobot and Ginkgo are doing together is just, um, you know, the necessity of complementary partnerships to deliver these types of systems at scale. Um, and then I'll go and I'll kind of like tie that a little bit more together. Also, what I think probably many people like that dealt with this world and thought about it before deeply understood, but then the practicality of COVID has been the realization of how complex an ecosystem it is to deliver these technologies at scale and you know, I'll, I'll use the very specific, very back in the early parts of COVID, one of the things, you know, we were one of those pro bono um, companies that said we're a giant biology platform, we engineer biology for our daily jobs, and we should point that at, at pandemic response. We knew nothing about diagnostic testing. And we said, what does it take to deliver a diagnostic test in a non-traditional setting? And what we realized is, wow, it's complicated. You forget what the test is for, for a second, you have to have uh, physician orders, consents, you have to be able to communicate clearly to the folks taking that diagnostic test, you have to be able to provide transparent information about what's going on, you have to be able to get kits, you have to be able to make sure that those kits match the EUAs that they're operating under, you need to be able to go to a location and have healthcare staff collect those samples you have to be able to package those, keep them under specific conditions. You have to get them to the laboratory. You have to be integrated with the laboratory, laboratory information management systems so that your information about the patient demographics in a HIPAA controlled manner can be communicated only in the, in the components that, is, that are required from a regulatory standpoint so they can return results. So those results can go back to an individual and in an organization and they can make decisions because ultimately you're trying to provide testing to the individuals and organizations to make decisions about their ability to be in congregate settings or to mitigate their own risk to their individual self, their family, their school, their community. That is actually very complicated to build a nimble system to do that at scale. We actually became a software company. We built software from scratch, purpose designed around the use case of testing asymptomatic populations appropriately under regulatory guidance in non-traditional settings. And what that has allowed us to do then is become an interface and we, we have something like 10 different uh, EUA tests authorized that, that operate on the platform in a, in a uh, kind, of, um, kind of systems integrator type mindset, all of which operate under their own EUAs. They're available to healthcare professionals. 
where we currently run about 3,000 healthcare professionals across the country on a daily basis in schools collecting. And so if you think about what it takes to do, build the infrastructure to do large scale pathogen monitoring so it is prepared for the future. So when something new would, might hit our shores, it has been very interesting for us to learn the complexity of scale and how to do that at scale. Forget supply chains, which we've had to manage for 10 states in varying ways, whether it's a tube and a swab or an antigen kit. And so that to us is a, like a deep lesson learned that you kind of only build through massive number of partners operating in, with super generosity and good faith, trying to figure out how to deliver these systems at scale that becomes an asset for the country because now, now it, is, it exists in a way that it didn't exist two years ago. Um, so for me, the biggest kind of surprise learning is the, the, like just the complexity of that scale and all the different pieces, it's a multivariate problem it's not just does this kit have EUA and can you ship it in pallets to a school, right? Um, and I think that in, with a bunch of different partners has really been a really interesting learning for us and something that I, I don't think we, we want to kind of leave behind as a, as a world and as a country too quickly. Excellent, thank you. Um, and uh, regarding um, just the timing that we have left, I'm gonna jump to a couple of questions here as well from the audience, uh, which we're grateful for. Um, one is that, uh, so we've known COVID is floating around. We don't always know what variants are going to be emerge, uh, be emerging, but it's, it's a known virus that we're looking for, right? So in all of these systems um, across these different platforms, how do they work? Uh, do they need different approaches or different tooling or anything for looking for unknown threats as sort of a steady state tool? Or can they be pretty seamlessly used uh, for trying to pop that something unknown has been introduced? Mariana, first, and then that. With wastewater, it's a little bit of both. Um, you need um, the wastewater epidemiology infrastructure and network in place, which basically means you need to be able to have so a source of wastewater samples, which uh, wastewater treatment plants, there are 16,000 of them in the US that cover about 80% of the US population. So you know you want to have many of them plugged in and, and, and ready to contribute samples. Um, you want to be able to have the, the assay development capabilities in place in order to quickly catch new things. But also I think the, the true holy grail of this space would be to be able to apply uh, assays that are non-targeted uh, for example, based on DNA sequencing or mass, um, you know, mass spectrometry, like mass metabolomics types of analyses, and be able to catch um, new threats even before we know about it. I should say that we're not there yet. Like the the technology is not. We don't fully understand the system enough in order to be able to catch things before we know about it. But I think we can get there. And at the moment, uh, what we can do is to use basically just more broad technologies to begin to understand all of the families of viruses that we can detect in the wastewater. And, and in particular at BioBot, we will be looking at families that have pandemic potential, which are basically coronaviruses, which are influenza, and, and to begin to understand the diversity that is already there and be able to understand, how, you know, get the confidence of be able to flag new things um, before we know about them. Um, but I think that we can really think about uh, wastewater as, as a technology that you can run <clears throat> for very cheaply. You know, you can decrease the amount of testing you do to like once a week or once a month for periods of low infectious disease activity or risk. And you can quickly ramp it up, for example, to daily when you have a new threat or when you have an inflection point. And that's how we work also uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, in Massachusetts, um, the platform is adaptive. So we can very quickly, at a, you know, on an almost like a 
days notice, we can increase or decrease the frequency at which we are creating the data for them. And that's proven to be very valuable in um, not only like saving money, but just having the right data in the right time. And I think that's something we can be begin to extrapolate to a, a larger like nationwide network too. Excellent. And as you said, that would be the holy grail that we're aiming for, right? With early warning. Matt? And I'll just build on that. And I made a comment to one of the questions that was asked you know, similar to this. Um, it's a network, right? So you may find, so let's just like imagine an amazing future where you are, you know, globally, you have some baseline level of um, voluntary passenger based um, uh, surveillance capability that didn't exist before, but like we're doing with the CDC and Express Check here, but in many airports around the world which is a level of scale above what we would ever do today. It's not like the idea of surveilling travelers isn't something that has been talked about, but it's a level of scale above what we're doing today. And you're doing that with wastewater and it's a network, right? And then you might find the variant of concern in a clinic in, some, in the United States, or you, you might find it anywhere in the world. And that sequence, if you're on a common network with a lot of sharing of how you you version assays, just like you version software out in cybersecurity, right? Oh, hey, look, I've detected something. I'm going to version a patch or I'm going to version a software update. I'm going to version out an assay. Again, not a brand new concept, but not done at this scale before. So you're able to quickly version that out for detection purposes. Second to what Mariana's talking about in one of, and I posted in one of the other chats, like thinking about the super high-end bioinformatics that continue to accelerate in their capability and capacity. As you get a sample, we're able to look for variants, variants of variants, potential predictable variants, right? You're able to look for things that look weird, layperson's terms, right? Like, and that may or may not have presented themselves clinically yet. And because you're building sequencing onto the back end of large scale collection, you're able to do this at massive scale computationally. And that combination, especially as bioinformatics continues to evolve and uh, kind of exponentially increase in its power, is going to give us a lot of ability to look at the kind of diversity of potential threats because we know kind of the start point for so many of them. We can do this also, as you might have, you know, a couple comments, certainly can do this between species. It's just the scale of collection and then the versioning of that network that becomes super valuable. We're, we're doing it on a, um, you know, a, a starting to lay that the groundwork for that on a different scale, right? So we're able to, you know, essentially sequence all of these samples coming in from schools to the extent of consent's allowed. And then you're able to start looking for things that are more or left of event um, that uh, are important to be able to look for from an infectious disease perspective. Excellent, thank you. And I know we have just a few minutes left. We had a good question on data standards that was also pretty specific to what you might be doing, which I understand also might not be shareable publicly, but gets to a grander, very important question in thinking about early warning. Um, what data standards actually, we're gonna have to have different tools, different companies doing different things in different places, and it's all gonna have to get integrated. So in terms of data standards and being able to share readily and keeping data secure where it needs to be secure, um, do you have any specific, uh, it, within a, a quick soundbite, a, a specific wish or desire on that front in terms of how we move forward together and get to that point? Mariana first, then Matt. I mean, just to echo that, I completely agree that's going to become the largest bottleneck to implementing wastewater epidemiology as, a, as an early warning system for the country. Um, you know, the best, the best version of wastewater epidemiology is when we think about it as a weather map where data is widely available, comparable across time, across geographies, and with the ability to emit alerts that are reliable. And I think I should just flag that currently we're not set to enable this vision because the work is being conducted on a patchwork basis where a specific individual jurisdiction maybe uses a method in-house or has a, a specific vendor, um, but because the methods are not standardized, then the data is actually only relevant to them, but not comparable with other geographies and therefore not really 
stitched together to be able to leverage it as a country. So I think we need more uh, leadership at the federal level um, to enable these type of conversations, these types of collaborations, and make sure that all of the effort going into creating this data actually can, can result in, in preparing the country for, for the next pandemic. And I'll just, I'll just add very quickly, um, when we're talking about people and we're talking about samples, something that we care very, very deeply about, maybe obvious to this group, the, the technical words are the words like surveillance, right? But from our standpoint, data matters in communicating and making sure people understand that what we're talking about is the information that we care about for pathogen monitoring, for viral monitoring, and privacy has to be built as a core tenant to this future world of monitoring. There's too much, rightfully so, in many, many, many cases, there's too much mistrust of reuse and um, in, uh, inappropriate management of data, both domestically and globally. Um, so I think it needs to be at the forefront of, and Ginkgo, we feel very strongly about this. It needs to be at the forefront of the conversation that what we're talking about is non-human and what we're talking about are the threats uh, from viruses, from other pathogens, um, and that we're that's the data we care about. Um, so it's a more meta point maybe, but I think it's something that this community needs to continue to remember is a key point if we wanna do these types of things at scale and scale is what matters to protecting uh, ourselves from the next pandemic. Yeah, thank you both so much. Wholeheartedly agree um, on those final points. And again, we hope that our alliance to end biological threats helps to create better connectivity between organizations like you all and hospitals and academic centers, along with the federal government leaders who we know are working really hard on these things and characterize the challenges and the needs in order to move forward in a very similar manner. So hopefully we can all form good willpower together to work through these challenges and uh, create sustained investment in building on these and other inventions and innovations that have advanced in recent years during this pandemic all with the goal of preventing future pandemics of this scale from ever happening again. Um, I wanna thank you both again, um, our special guests for speaking about your own work um, and for taking the time to do so. I think telling that story really helps to paint a picture of what we're trying to aim for for the future in a way that uh, can seem abstract to non-experts. So I'm so, so grateful for your time. Thank you all to uh, everybody who participated and joined the conversation. We've also logged your excellent questions and they will help us inform future conversations. This is gonna be one of many events where we try to highlight the progress that has been made or that we're on the cusp of achieving together as a nation and international community in this field with the hope of propelling continual momentum and progress in this area. Thank you again to everyone for joining us. Um, tune in to future CSR uh, events and follow us on Twitter at CSRisks. Uh, and thanks again. We'll see you all next time.